Morning today is Jan Friday, January 29th, and you are uh, watching a uh, joint House Committee meetings of the House Human Services Committee and the um, House Education Committee. Um, our testimony this morning is focused on the um, governor's proposed uh, child care uh, plan. And um, so I'm going to turn it over uh, first to uh, the commissioner of DCF, Sean Brown. Commissioner. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I first introduced myself for the record, uh, Sean Brown, uh, commissioner for the Vermont Department for Children and Families. And with us today, we have leadership from other uh, departments within um, the Agency of Human Services. We have Dr. Levine from the Health Department, and we have uh, uh, Commissioner Squirrel from the Department of um, mental health. And then also we have uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher, uh, Heather Boucher from the Agency of Education. And we all appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide a high level overview of the governor's vision to restructure the child development division and realign um, early care and learning under the Agency of Education and streamline the delivery of other um, important services within different departments within uh, the Agency of Human Services. Um, as, and before we jump into the, uh, into the high level overview, I do want to stress that, um, you, know, you know, as we provide this overview, the timeline for this proposal um, is implementation, uh, the earliest would occur would be July 1st, 2022. So there's no proposals or dollars um, implicated in this year's Budget Adjustment Act or in the 22 build um, that was just um, delivered by the governor. Um, none of, you know, so you'll not see any budgetary impacts currently. Um, we recognize that this is the start of the conversation um, and that a lot of work and conversation needs to happen with our providers, our partners um, to gain their um, feedback and input on this and allow time for that planning and those conversations. That's a piece of that almost 18 month implementation period. Um, I think we're all the leadership of all of these departments and agencies are here because we strongly believe this proposal will lead to better outcomes and delivery of services for children and families um, in, in what is now a, a bifurcated system. Um, and that um, we, you know, as we move forward, we welcome the feedback and questions from the committee. Um, but just keep in mind that um, we believe this is the start of the conversation and not, and not the end of the conversation. So, and, uh, so um, are we able to have uh, Sarah uh, Truckle, who's with us as well, our chief financial officer from the department, uh, control the PowerPoint so she can uh, put it up on the screen? Uh, yes, we can. Give me a minute. I just have to find Sarah on this long list. Okay. Okay, Sarah. Is everyone able to see the screen? Yes. So Sarah, if you wanna to jump just to slide five, just so we can quickly just provide a high level overview of, of, of what we're looking at. Um, you know, in, in our proposal that we're presenting today, um, it really looks at um, uh, the Child Development Division and all the different functions um, uh, that it has under its umbrella uh, of moving pieces and components of it um, to complete a system of care that right now are, are bifurcated. Um, so we're proposing that um, the early uh, care and learning move under the agency of education and unify uh, essentially a cradle to career system of care and learning for Vermont's kids. It's been a long-term vision of, of our governor um, and this proposal moves that, um, uh, uh, that vision forward. Um, also, it looks at the pieces of the child development division that look at child and maternal health and home visiting and the children's integrated services and would move that um, under the Department of Health. 
um, and then some mental health components um, of services provided um, through the uh, oversight of the Child Development Division and the funding would move to the Department of Mental Health. Um, and then uh, the piece regarding the, um, the child care subsidy program, the financial program would move um, from the child development division over to the economic services division, which has um, experience, a long history and experience of running um, financial eligibility programs. We are not proposing a change in how those services are delivered in that program now. Um, those services are delivered by our community partners. Um, for referral service and financial eligibility are done across the state through uh, contracts. Many of them are, are our parent child centers. We are not proposing any changes to that system. Just the administration of those and work with those partners would fall under the umbrella of the economic services division under this proposal. Um, you know, in the pieces that would move to the Department of Health, um, you know, you know, the Department of Health is responsible for, you know, public health and maternal health and many of our prevention services and grants that we administer through the Child Development Division are really grounded in a public health response. And so that's why we're proposing the, the components of, of, of the Child Development Division that focus on those public health responses. Um, and many of them that leverage Medicaid funding, which is also a major source of some of those services provided from, um, you know, services provided at the health department and within the child development division um, and those core services that come with those dollars um, would be realigned from CDD, the children's integrated services would be moved over, although the services would be unbundled, um, they would still be provided um, to, um, um, and build down through the Medicaid program um, as many of our other providers do as well. And then also we're proposing our master grants would move under the health department, you know, that fund the parent child centers. So we're not proposing any changes to those, but just that those would now be administered um, under the health department. And then also this proposal would really realign um, all of our home visiting that occurs in our different areas. You know, a, part, a point of our work has been recently, particularly in our CHINS reform um, work group space, is um, looking at expanding our prevention services and home visiting that's seen as a core prevention strategy in, in, in um, improving the health and well being of, of vulnerable families and children at risk. Um, and, and some of the new uh, CHINS money that we received in the restatement budget um, are now um, uh, going to be passed through to the uh, Department of Health and really um, bolster um, our, our home visiting capability. And we believe aligning all of our home visiting under um, that health department umbrella uh, would provide better integration um, and leveraging uh, op funding opportunities and also um, leveraging their expertise and their evidence-based programs that they administer through the health department. And we think that that would lead to much better outcomes for children and family. And I would turn it over doctor, to Dr. De Levine to kind of touch on what they see um, as the benefits uh, to this approach as well. Should I take that as my cue? <laughs> yes. Just, yes. Just, yes, Commissioner. I just wanted to, uh, politically uh, appropriate deferral to the chair, that's all. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, on record, I am Commissioner Mark Levine of the Department of Health. Um, and I will build on some of the concepts that Commissioner Brown just uh, discussed. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, obviously, I'll give you the punchline, we support moving the proposed elements of CDD to VDH. Uh, as you'll see, uh, sometimes history recapitulates and there are some things that are actually returned to ways they were prior to me and many other commissioners uh, being on board. I believe it capitalizes on opportunities for uh, unification of some programs, uh, certainly improved integration of programs and really some very, uh, currently existent strong partnerships and working relationships across uh, the agency, including with DCF and DMH, but also uh, 
a very uh, progressively strengthening relationship with AOE uh, that I would say was pre-existing before the pandemic and has only by necessity gotten stronger uh, during the pandemic. There's also some potential for uh, increases of efficiencies and strategizing and uh, la uh, eliminating redundancies. And I think, uh, as you'll see in my comments, there's a recognition of um, the centrality and importance of public health in so many of the programs that we're going to be discussing. So what are some of the advantages and strengths of this uh, proposed approach? Starting with uh, the focus on public health and programming, uh, clearly uh, at their core, home visiting and the Parent Child Center Master Grants are public health programs. The strategies they employ are aligned with the department's Division of Maternal and Child Health approach and programming. Um, the funds from CDD support families of children with special health needs, which were originally housed at VDH and are well aligned with our children with special health needs programs uh, in, in MCH. We've talked a lot with uh, this committee actually about universal approach to home visiting and a unified approach. Strong Families Vermont is currently shared between MCH and CDD. And I do think we try to function uh, with a single voice across the leadership teams in this transition to Strong Families Vermont. Uh, the development of the continuum and the movement towards evidence-based sustained home visiting this gap can lead to confusion in the field and staffing and other resource redundancies. Uh, so this could be a clear improvement above that. In terms of aligning across the same system, Help Me Grow Vermont is housed uh, at VDH in, in, in the MCH division. And it's a system model for improving access to existing resources and services for expectant parents and families with young children uh, all the way up until age eight. And it promotes healthy development of children by supporting families, providers, and communities to link children and families to the services and supports they need. Bringing the home visiting and the PCC master grants to the health department would indeed support uh, much more consistent messaging and buy-in from the field. And it would demonstrate alignment across parts of the same system. If there's something that VDH is noted for, it's being data-driven and evidence-based. We'd like to think we're a model for that and that we have a proven track record in how we manage and analyze data and implement evidence-based programming. And we've clearly worked successfully with many community-based agencies to support and elevate data gathering and fidelity to model implementation across multiple doma domains. CIS as a standalone program in CDD doesn't always have the same access to the in-house technical and analytical expertise that could be provided in such a uh, future transformation. And it would help them with uh, efficiently completing necessary data collection, analysis, um, reporting, uh, all those functions that are so critical. We have in the MCH division and across the health department, a very strong backbone of quality and performance improvement, running programs with sub-recipients to improve service delivery, such as recruitment, retention, screening, and referral. I do think that um, having a sort of single point of contact does streamline processes and points of contact for some agencies. And, um, it would help community agencies that have to work with multiple state departments on their contractual issues uh, and the technical assistance that's provided. On the theme of kind of redundancies and staffing and other fiscal and implementation resources, as Commissioner Brown said, we're not here to talk so much fiscally at this point, but obviously this could provide an opportunity to maximize resources eliminate positions that might be duplicative and um, make the representation on things like task forces with early childhood groups and other councils uh, 
much more equally represented and uh, uni uniformly represented. Um, really, in summary, uh, on this part of my presentation, improving coordination and better measurement and quality improvement would be expected to lead to better outcomes for families. You know, I don't think uh, on day one, families are gonna recognize an immediate impact. Uh, hopefully they won't see uh, the background changes um, and we don't anticipate immediate changes in any service delivery pattern or partners or methods. But I think this kind of coordination and data measurement and the analytics and quality improvement with targeted technical assistance and less redundancy of resources can certainly have a downstream favorable impact on Vermont kids and families, which really is the core of our proposal and what we would love to see um, better outcomes in. So those are my uh, um, somewhat higher level as, as keeping on the theme of Sean Brown uh, comments regarding the impact uh, of some of the moves to the Department of Health. Uh, Commissioner, I thank you for that. And I'm aware that it is 1041 and you may have somewhere else to go. I do see that um, David Englander is here and I don't know if someone else from... Uh, uh, yes, Elisa Stahlberg, uh, our director of MCH is oh, here. There you well. are. Um, and so... Um, um, I don't want to hold. I don't want to hold you from the governor's press conference. We could ask them. Is it all right for them to, for us to ask them questions later on? Yes, they're they're prepared for that, and uh, I'll be on for another five or six minutes, uh, oh, okay. just as an observer uh, of the next testimony. Okay. Um, <clears throat> committees. Does it make sense um, that we'll just we'll get the overview and then we'll start asking questions? Still. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn this back over to you, um, Commissioner Brown, to uh, orchestrate who goes next in this multifaceted plan. Sure, thank you. And I know uh, Commissioner Squirrel also has some time sensitive um, concerns today as well and needing, uh, has other commitments. And so um, uh, another piece of this um, uh, proposal are, are moving those early childhood and family mental health services that currently reside within um, uh, the child development division and some of that, that those mental health dollars are, we're proposing, you know, to improve service delivery and coordination for families um, of moving those pieces to the department of mental health. And I'll defer to Sarah to kind of um, uh, touch on those points as well. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Um, good morning. For the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, wonderful to see everyone this morning. Uh, I think this slide really illustrates how DMH thinks about our work, particularly in the children's system, uh, from a comprehensive public health approach, uh, promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. Uh, certainly when we think about early childhood and family mental health, um, it really gets at a targeted area uh, that we can do more with. Um, certainly, I think we would all agree that we need to build capacity for promotion and early intervention for children. I think we have a critical opportunity across the system to go upstream and to intervene earlier. Uh, we certainly know the impact of trauma, adverse childhood experiences on children, um, and they're setting long-term health trajectories in their earliest years. Uh, so the bottom line is the earlier we intervene, the better the outcomes. And that's precisely what EC ECFMH is designed to do. Um, and we see it as absolutely critical and vital to Vermont families and communities. Uh, we do support the shift of the early childhood and family mental health um, component of this to the Department of Mental Health. Uh, just a little bit of history on this as well. It's, it's always helpful to look backwards as we look forwards. Um, in FY12, this funding actually historically sat with the Department of Mental Health. Um, and I believe it was in FY12 um, that we transferred these monies um, to DCF for inclusion um, in the CIS bundles. So that's just a little bit of background um, in terms of the history 
um, of the funding. There are, if uh, Sarah, you can go to the next slide. Just for the committee's understanding, there are two components um, to early childhood and family mental health. Um, the first is treatment services. And those treatment services are really designed to provide um, clinical treatment to a child or their family um, who has a diagnosed or demonstrated need. Um, we use a lot of evidence-based practices to provide those services and treatment. Um, that includes anything from clinical assessment, service planning and coordination, individual and group community supports, um, individual and family therapy, uh, as well as medication monitoring. Um, those services are provided by the designated agencies, um, which is a network of providers that we oversee and work with on a regular basis. Um, the other element of early childhood and family mental health is the consultation and education. And again, that is a truly um, preventative um, and promotive activity where we are providing consultation and education um, to the adults in the child's life um, to really support them um, through parenting and to build capacity for them to support um, their children um, who may have um, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. I would say in terms of the split of funding, about 75% of it is targeted for the treatment component of early childhood and family mental health. And about 25% of it is utilized for the consultation and education. Of course, as we move forward, we would like to grow the consultation and education um, portion of this. Uh, we think that's the right direction to go uh, from a promotion standpoint. I do think there's an opportunity here where we can really streamline this work and this funding um, under the Department of Mental Health. Um, and we can also leverage the flexibility of payment reform. Um, so this committee or committees may be aware that the Department of Mental Health has implemented payment reform. Our designated agencies are paid on a case rate. So by having these fundings, um, this funding included in that case rate, we, do, we really do create the opportunity, I think, to grow um, in this area. Um, as well as to leverage the flexibility of payment reform under the Department of Mental Health um, to provide more services um, in this kind of prevention arena. Uh, so I think I will leave it at that for now. Um, and hopefully that's a, a good overview uh, for the committee um, in terms of the early childhood and family mental health portion of this. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and just in terms of your time frame. Um, when do you have to leave? And if you leave, is there someone here as well from uh, DMH? Yes, so I believe I am the only person from DMH here. Um, so I will probably just turn my camera off and try to do some coordination of my schedule um, to ensure that there is someone from DMH here to answer follow-up questions. Thank you, appreciate of it. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Brown, you're still in charge of the flow. Great, thank you. And I think uh, the next piece we'd want to touch on in this proposal um, is, is the piece of realigning the early care and learning um, all within the agency of education to, to really create that cradle to career ladder uh, for Vermont youth, which really would uh, align and integrate a, a really bifurcated system right now and some funding systems as well. Um, and with us today, we have uh, the Deputy Secretary, um, Heather Boucher from the Agency of Education. Um, we believe from um, uh, you know, the administrations that, that this really moves forward, um, the ability to serve um, families and kids holistically within one system of care um, to really lead to better outcomes for those families, make it easier for them to access those systems. Um, right now, um, there's multiple, you know, depending if you have your child in a private pre-K or a public pre-K, there's different ways you access that, those systems. And so families that might have kids in different systems, it can be quite confusing um, or, or switching from one system to the other depending on your circumstances, aligning it all within one system could really streamline those processes as well. It will it would also um, align the IDA Part B and Part C funding streams and the services um, that they provide. Um, and, and then also just lead to better outcomes for kids educationally and, and 
Also, uh, you know, that I would also highlight as Dr. Levine indicated, um, before I turn it over to Deputy Secretary Boucher is, um, it would really allow us to streamline the collection of data and the analysis of data, which is really key to improving, you know, system delivery and outcomes for kids. By, by aligning it within one system, um, it really strengthens our ability um, to do that work better. And, um, and I'll just turn it over now to, to Deputy Secretary Boucher to kind of touch on where they see the benefits for families and kids in the systems um, with this initiative. Great, I think that is my cue. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yes. I can't see, I can't see <laughs> folks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, on our proposal this morning. Um, for the record, as Commissioner Brown said, my name is uh, Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary of Education. Very happy to be here with uh, both committees and my colleagues this morning. So as we've already highlighted, the proposal uh, talks about grouping the administration, regulation, licensing, professional development, general education and special education components of Vermont's early child care and education systems all together into a new division at the Agency of Education, which would be early care and learning. And then as you certainly um, heard from uh, my much more um, knowledgeable colleagues, there would also be public health components, mental health components and financial assistance components, which we haven't talked about yet, that would also um, uh, potentially move um, as part of this proposal. So the restructuring with respect to the administrative regulatory and education components of the state childcare system aligns with I think as Commissioner Brown alluded to, Governor Scott's broader uh, cradle to career education model. And the goal of that framework is to do everything in our power as state government to ensure that individuals emerge ready to engage in society as productive informed citizens. And we all know that making sure all of our children from birth onward get off to a good start is a critical way to achieve that long-term goal. I really appreciate what uh, Commissioner Brown said earlier about sort of the timeline of this approach and that this really is just uh, an initial um, conversation um, to kind of think about the concept. Um, certainly we would want to engage many uh, stakeholder groups um, over the next 18 months um, to, to um, ensure that all voices were heard and that we were uh, moving in um, hopefully a direction that had a significant buy-in um, across the state. Uh, given that, I'd like to state up front that um, it's not a strategy to destabilize or weaken Vermont's private childcare system in Vermont. Uh, we recognize that that's uh, some concern uh, that folks have already been communicating to us and we wanna assure um, the private childcare uh, field that that's not the intention or impetus of this proposal. Um, in fact, the private system is a, is a critical necessary infrastructure in our state. Instead, this proposal is about restructuring government operations to maximize efficient and timely processing of applications, monitoring and regulation. And um, as uh, Commissioner Levine talked about, also eliminate redundancy that currently exists across two agencies. And ultimately we feel allow more time to be spent serving children and families, which is what I believe we all want. Um, in a, you know, instead of now spending a lot of time navigating um, cross agency uh, issues, challenges, ways of doing things, this would, we believe, allow us to um, spend more time actually the, doing uh, the provision of um, services and, and really focusing on our families and our children. So the slide in front of you shows the breakdown of the current CDD activities and programs that would be moving um, over to the AOE. Uh, as I said, um, the proposal really aims to integrate childcare licensing, general management and oversight, professional development, early intervention, intervention uh, systems integration, Head Start oversight and contracts and grant management um, with, with AOE's longstanding work in the pre-K space. Currently, in addition to shared oversight of the pre-K program with CDD under Act 166, 
The AOE provides leadership support and oversight on early learning education standards from birth through six, also known as VELS, the Vermont Early Learning Education Standards, uh, assessment, again, from birth through six, um, early childhood special education, um, early multi-tiered systems of support, and pre-qualification for universal pre-K programs. Um, in terms of assessment, you might be familiar with um, the TS Gold program and the Readiness for Kindergarten survey. So these pieces are already what the agency has in play that would um, integrate very well with the proposal that, that um, we're putting forth um, for uh, you know, conversation and, and further discussion. In addition, and I think both uh, Commissioner Levine and Commissioner Brown mentioned this, um, the, the um, potential um, uh, positive aspects that could be, um, could be brought to bear uh, in terms of data management and analysis are pretty exciting to us as well. So our data management at AOE, our data management and analysis division called DMAD already collects, analyzes and reports on the required data for both federal and state requirements with respect to the universal pre-K space, including Head Start. And this proposed restructuring would allow for greater integration of all early care and learning data sources, which would enable us to better discern how to support students and families from birth through high school graduation and beyond. Um, so really um, happy um, to um, hear about your thoughts on the proposal. Uh, we definitely look forward to collaborating with the legislature, hopefully on a bill to move this concept forward. And um, I'm happy to take any questions as well as my colleagues. Thanks. And we support the proposal. I didn't say that, but hopefully that was clear. Um, thank you. And I don't mean to tease all of you, but you do work for the governor. And you, when he supports this, so I'm presuming you all have, you all support it, or we wouldn't be here. Um, but it's glad to hear, you, glad to hear you say it publicly. Um, Kim, uh, Commissioner, uh, I don't know if there are other slides that uh, you want to. I'm turning it back to Commissioner Brown, who. Yeah, I, I, the, I would just touch on the, the, the pieces that will remain within the Department for Children and Families. Um, you know, we've talked about what would be moving out to other um, and, you know, other departments within AHS and then also going over to the Agency of Education. Um, and as I touched on the Child uh, Care Financial Assistance Program and eligibility determination piece would stay within DCF. It would move over to the Economic Services Division. So it would fall into place with like the other financial benefit programs we administer there along with the uh, Reach Up, Free Squares Vermont, General Assistance in the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. So we would just add in the CCFAT program there as well. And so the team that, that administers that program would move over to economic um, services. Um, on the ground, um, there would really be no um, change in terms of what uh, Vermonters see in terms of accessing referrals and trying to locate childcare and also who they apply through and, and where they receive their determination. All of those components would remain in place. It would just be th that the oversight and administration of those grants and contracts would move over to the economic services division. Also some of the prevention work that's really connected to the family services division would stay within DCF for that purpose. And then also um, transportation, you know, we're moving forward with a uh, you know, try to do a statewide master grant for transportation, given that cuts across so many of um, our programs and services. And so that would be, we would still coordinate that, um, whether it's for the family services division, uh, you know, the reach up program, or, or, or uh, you know, a, a child care reasons as well that we would coordinate and issue um, and manage those funds and contracts as well in service delivery for transportation within DCF. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up um, for questions and maybe um, turn to Representative Webb um, if she has any comments and then I see that Representative Coopley has raised his hand. 
Thank you. Uh, and thank you, um, Madam Chair, for including our com education committee in on this important discussion. Um, I had following up on questions about Children's Integrative Services, CIS, and CISEI, uh, the portion that is uh, early intervention. Am, am I understanding that that part of it is moving to health and part of it is moving to the Agency of Education? Uh, and uh, if that, well, first, is that correct? Yeah, there are components, the Children's Integrated Services a piece would be moving to the um, Department of Health, um, you know, their maternal child and uh, health division. Um, the I, you know, some of the specialized education services and ID, IDA part uh, dollars would then move over to the uh, Agency of Education and um, realign those with the Part B dollars that already exist within the Agency of Education. So I'm just having a, a concern coming from the field that while this might increase efficiency and reduce redundancy, it might be um, it might might give uh, families fewer options. Is that your impression that it, it might be less sensitive to the needs of families? Um, we we don't believe that. We believe by it will actually open up opportunities um, in, in new areas for families and children by being able to leverage the work and expertise and providers that work with the health department um, and also th those ser specialized services that already exist in many of the uh, of this uh, the education system already. And so that it would we believe it would open up opportunities in, in uh, collaboration and integration that just don't exist now in our, in our bar bifurcated system. And my, my second and last question um, so far would be, whenever I hear cradle to career, I hear the sound of the education fund. Um, and I know that, that the governor has had a lot of interest in being able to uh, use education fund dollars for some of his other initiatives. And I'm wondering, if that is something that you are considering in this as well. Yeah, that's not a part of our proposal. Uh, the funding that supports uh, the pieces uh, in CDD that, that, that um, will move with the work that goes with, that, with those pieces to the appropriate agencies so that um, we're, we're not proposing a change in the funding structure for these programs per se, it would just be realigning the dollars and services that already exist for this um, um, uh, over like, you know, the, all of the, the CDD funding for, uh, you know, to support the early care and learning system and the professional development would move with that um, in the 23 uh, state fiscal year 23 budget uh, over to the agency of education, all of the CIS funding and, and service dollars would move over. Although I, I do want to be very clear that, um, you know, while those services will still be provided through the children's integrated services, we're proposing that those services be unbundled and then be uh, um, still be accessed by our providers, but, but get billed through the normal Medicaid provider system. Um, there are significant um, administrative dollars tied to that bundle. Um, and our proposal would be that those efficiencies gained there would allow us, uh, in this proposal, any efficiencies will get reinvested back into the system and, and support additional services for families and kids. Um, but, you know, so I want to be clear about that as a piece of this proposal. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kupali. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, is Sarah still with us, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner Squirrel? Uh, yes, she's in two places at once. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Commissioner, are you able to hear us right now? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I have a question that, sure. that has been on my mind for some time now, particularly with our children being out of school but what is the, are you hearing um, issues with mental health and perhaps even suicides? Yes, it's a, a, a great question. Thank you. Um, certainly right now, uh, we know 
that the impact of COVID um, is, and the pivot to remote learning is having an impact on our children and youth across the state, even prior to going into COVID. Um, if we refer back to some of the youth risk behavior survey data that we all look at and um, pay attention to, particularly for adolescents, uh, we were starting to see increases, significant increases in depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation. Um, and we know with the ongoing impact of COVID, uh, remote learning, you know, particularly for adolescents, um, who this is a point developmentally for them where interaction with peers is really critical to their development and their identity. Um, you know, those are groups that we do worry about. Uh, when we look at the data in terms of demand, um, for child and youth mental health services. Uh, we are seeing an uptick. Fortunately, we are not seeing an uptick in terms of demand for really high levels of care, such as inpatient right now. Um, but at the same time, in terms of, you know, just general demand for counseling services, outpatient services, uh, residential services, uh, we are seeing increases. So that certainly is something that we are concerned about um, and I think why our efforts and potential focus on reopening schools is also uh, a really important factor right now. Thank you. And, um, Madam Chair, I have one more question for Deputy Secretary Boucher, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, again, have a concern about whether or not um, the agency has the personnel to accomplish all of these little goals we have. Can you address so, that? So, yeah, so just to clarify, the existing personnel that would continue these functions would move over to the Agency of Education. So there isn't a plan right now to reduce um, that personnel. Okay, thank you. Does that clarify? The question? Yes. 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 Yeah. I mean, I think I think the details would be worked out as we move forward. But that's from our perspective, the agency of education's perspective. This is not um, really a cost saving measure. It's really about the concept and make and and the vision of what we're trying to do. Um, so so we're not coming into this thinking that um, you know we're really thinking of it as step one. It would just be really moving the components that fit with education over to education, including the funding streams, as Commissioner Brown already said. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Coopley. Are you finished for right now with questions? Okay, we have, we're beginning to have a lineup. Um, which is good. We have um, Representative Wood, we have Representative Conlin, McFawn, and Paella right now. And Redmond is, right now is the lineup. Uh, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of questions and um, the, the bundling and unbundling, I'm not sure. I, I guess uh, Commissioner Brown, maybe that will be for you. Um, uh, so uh, certainly from a provider perspective, the bundling of uh, a group of um, services allows flexibility um, at, at the provider front and more flexibility in, in addressing family needs and seems like unbundling those things um, would do the opposite. And we'd be referring back to uh, essentially a fee for service uh, modality that what existed prior to the bundling, which is fairly recent. Um, so I, if, if you could address that, I would appreciate it. Sure, and I would also um, have Sarah Truckle jump in here as well. Um, you know, it will unbundle those services. And I think um, what you would hear from our providers, um, you know, when we just went through payment, you know, realign, you know, the, those bundled payments and, and restructured those. Um, there were some providers who gained from that and there were some providers who lost from that. And that was a large concern. And so that's a fixed rate for that bundle. If, if you break out those services, um, it allows more flexibility to, 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 to bill for those services a little differently. And so we believe that, you know, while, while it, you know, it might um, 
lead to having to, you know, in terms of the way they draw down those funds will be different. It opens up opportunities and it also opens up opportunities to do it that way in, into our existing payment reform systems that we're trying to move forward in the different, in the different systems of care that we have. Um, and so that, um, and we would say there's a pretty high admin rate built into those, into the, into those <laughs> rates right now. It's 36%. And so if we were able to reduce those and build those back into services, it would, it would expand what those, you know, what we could provide for services for kids and families that they might not be getting now through that bundled rate. And I would ask Sarah Truckle to jump in here as well to provide any more technical um, explanation on that as well. Happy to do so. So Sarah Truckle, DCF Financial Director for the record. Um, as the committee recalls, we went through a process uh, in Children's Integrated Services around payment reform and currently have a statewide bundled case rate, which was not um, the bundled case rate that was identified from the consulting group of Burns and Associates as the uh, current bundle. So as you recall from last year, your com committee actually made the recommendation to fund the bundle at I believe it was the $633 rate. Um, but currently the bundle is funded um, just over, I think it's $509 as a case rate. Um, in the proposal here of unbundling through payment reform, we were actually able to identify which funds and which costs of services are attributed to each one of those core CIS services. So what funds are associated with early intervention, what funds are associated with um, early childhood family mental health, specialized childcare and home visiting. Um, through that process, there's also funds that go into the administration of CIS. So that's the, um, the uh, costs associated with the fiscal agents, the regional CIS team, the local CIS coordinators, the intake and referral and the coordination. Um, the bundled case rate allows for flexibility in the sense of services, but it, it comes with that high associated administrative cost. What we're proposing here is to unbundle those services, but then reinvest those costs into services for kids. Um, the other standpoint, which I'm sure the Department of Mental, or, the Department of Health would also be able to establish is right now the bundle includes home visiting services, but we also have home visiting services that take place out of the bundle on a fee for service pace pay situation. So there's a lot of different interplays going on right now. And, and this really aligns the dollars in the service delivery that benefits children and families. Uh, thank you for the information. It creates a whole list of more questions, but I'll save those for later. Um, my other question is for uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher. Um, so uh, really just this weekend, um, a little bit earlier, we heard some data about uh, children um, ready to learn and the, the high percentage of children from the data that uh, kids entering kindergarten are, are really um, at a high level ready to learn. And of course we can always improve, but that the data is looking very good in that level. And to me, that says that the early care and learning system is actually doing a pretty good job. Um, the, uh, in contrast, we also look at the, at the third grade level um, data and it shows that there's a significant difference, let's just say between the ready to learn and the um, achievement at third grade levels. And um, so I'm trying to figure out how this is really going to benefit children uh, in a system that seems to be performing pretty well right now. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Thank you for the question. So, um, you know, I think someone spoke to this earlier. I, I don't we're not planning to actually change services. We're planning, we're planning to change how the back end looks in delivering those services and to actually have a more streamlined approach so that we actually have more capacity to continue uh, what's already happening in the early child uh, space so that we're not spending as much time negotiating across different um, human services or, or different agencies, human services and the agency of education. So I don't, um, we're really not talking about changing um, the basic aspects of what the staff are doing. It's really where the staff are actually going to be housed. 
So I think that's really important. Um, I would I would have to reflect a little bit more on um, equating sort of the the implicated association that somehow the K twelve system is not a good system and the current early child care system is a good system based on just test scores. I think that there's some really important things we'd wanna consider and look at, um, you know, uh, in addition um, to sure. that. Yeah. And that wasn't my reference. My reference was really about uh, looking at what the um, current success of the early care um, system uh, is and, and trying to figure that out. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. Um, Representative Conlon. Good morning. Uh, just briefly, uh, you know, I, I heard at the beginning, this is kind of the start of a conversation, uh, all that. Could you talk a little bit about timing, when language will be produced that's gonna come before these committees um, and how that's gonna play out? Sure, we have a, uh, some draft language and that we'd like to submit. And I think, you know, the idea is that we would move the idea for to create um, uh, like committees of, of uh, our partners across the spectrum that will be impacted to start having the conversations of what makes sense, how to do this technically to move it forward, how do we um, uh, capitalize on those integration um, uh, and streamlining opportunities to increase uh, services for families and kids, and then come back in uh, the, for the 23 budget with a, with a uh, financial proposal and the staff moves and the details and a plan of how that work would happen. That's our vision is that we really kick it off this year um, with, with, with a framework, a legislative framework, but then come back in to the session next year with, with those details worked out with our partners and, and also highlight areas where we weren't able to come to an agreement. Um, and, and then have those conversations with the various committees of jurisdiction of how do we move that forward and, and what does the final uh, plan look like that gets implemented that following July. I think that's our vision here. Hmm. Um, uh, Commissioner Brown, I just might comment that today is the last day that yes. a, a long form uh, bill may be requested in the house, but yes. doing anything at the last minute is fine. Um, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question about history. Um, and I think probably Commissioner Brown, you might be the one that has to answer this one. Um, in the presentations, we talked, some of the uh, commissioners talked about uh, history. And they said that these services were previously provided by that agency. Um, I happened to be around when uh, all of this, uh, these services were switched to DCF. Um, my question is, what is wrong? Uh, we, uh, there was a reason for making that move and taking those services out of those different departments and putting them in one place. Um, what happened that makes you think that we need to put them back now to where they were in the first place? So I'd like the question, why were they moved in the first place? And now that we're at this point, why, why do we have to move them back? What's happened within the agency to make that happen? I wouldn't say that necessarily something's happened within the agency, uh, Representative McFawn. I would say that um, decisions are made at a point in time based on information and data that's available and, and the current thinking and practice at that time. And then as you know, those uh, programs and dollars and practices evolve, you know, and also how, how uh, the needs of, of Vermont families and children evolve, you should always be looking like, does our, does our system currently meet the needs of families? And, be, and what we're seeing is that we have, as our systems have, have developed, you know, these changes, they've become very siloed and bifurcated. And, you know, and, and there's, you know, uh, the, the Child Development Division has been asked to become a mental health provider, a public health provider, 
when, when there are already departments within state government that really that's their area of expertise. You know, so, so though we believe those agencies should be taking the lead in the delivery of those um, expert of those services. They are the experts in those areas. You know, we don't, they, they, they oversee and manage the, the designated agencies that deliver a lot of the services that, that, that the um, child development division contracts for. Yet we don't oversee those providers. We don't have those established relationships. We're, we're, we're on the periphery of that. And so the, what makes sense to us is that those dollars and services should really align with the department that has the primary responsibility and, and expertise and history of working with those providers and the, the delivery of services to those, to those same families in different areas is really a bifurcated system. And it's the same on the health department. Um, you know, and in terms of the piece that goes to AOE, I don't, you know, there's always been um, the private um, regulated um, um, early learning and care system. But as, as we evolve and look at the educational needs of our kids and the transitions that we ask of them as they move through a, a different ages and different, different programs, it's very complicated. And the handoff is not always smooth, you know, from zero to three or three to five and then, and, and then into, the, into the kindergarten system. Um, th that by moving it into the agency uh, that oversees, you know, early, you know, learning uh, for kindergarten and some of pre-K to align it all it just seems to make sense when you're really trying to um, envision how do we support kids from birth um, through post-grad, you know, through 12th grade, how do we, and how do we leverage better outcomes? That comes through data analysis um, and, and streamlined systems, and that's not possible in our bifurcated system right now we you know we're not looking to change the, the you know the private system we're, we're looking to strengthen it through this system we believe that's that that's the outcome we're looking for okay thank you i i, I but my memory serves me what you just said was the reason why it was all put together in um, in uh, your agency but that, that, you've answered my question thank you and Representative McBaum, we can, um, that might be something to, um, for both committees or one committee to explore, because when you look at a policy resource document from February um, 2016, it says, quote, recognizing those programs serving young children and their families are most effective when they are integrated. Vermont has taken several steps to build a coordinated system child development and family support services. Talks about CIS um, and how these services were previously provided through separate programs with distinct right. funding streams. So we'll talk about that and we'll find out um, at another time probably um, as to how the hiring is going because um, I believe we need a CIS director um, currently. Um, so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, um, we have one, two, three, four. We have um, four um, people who still want to um, ask questions. It is 11.23. Um, Representative um, Fiella. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, Commissioner Brown just said that he's hoping that this will help strengthen um, the private provider side of childcare. And I'm just wondering how you envision the regulated at home childcare providers playing into this, because it seems like this is much more geared specifically towards center-based care. And I think um, at home providers are an integral part of providing access across the state. Yeah, and I would ask uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher to jump in here as well. Um, but we don't see it as just benefiting, you know, those those large private centers. But we also see it benefiting, um, you know, the smaller family-based uh, care homes as well. Um, you know, the CDD staff um, it is small, relatively speaking, to the size of the right of, of the system of care out there for early care and learning. Um, if you look at the resources and the depth in the education system that exists throughout the state, um, you know, overseen 
by the agency of education. I think your you know, providers will be able to leverage um, those connections and those services and that expertise locally you know, and be more responsive than most likely our staff could be just given um, you know, we're relatively small. And then what, when you're looping in and building connections to those uh, school districts and, you know, and making sure those transitions of those kids happen smoothly in the care of those kids and the learning for those kids, I think there's an opportunity for providers to, um, you, know, you know, to work closely with their, their local education system. And I think there's value in that. I would defer to uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher to jump in here as well on that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a great question, Representative Payala. So thank you for uh, posing it. Uh, just to clarify, when I say private, I mean all private providers. So not just center-based care, um, all, 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 whether they're home-based, um, whether they're private, um, you know, really it's the private piece that I was trying to actually um, note. So I agree that, uh, so if, if we actually, you know, there, back to Representative Kupali's uh, question earlier, there are ways we can actually um, better integrate what we're doing in terms of um, pre-qualification for programs, whether they're in-home, whether they're um, in center-based care, um, that could really, um, I think, free up some resources again so that we can be doing more things that I think would benefit all of our child care folks. So it would allow us to be able to provide uh, professional development um, training more um, cohesively for all of our um, early child care providers, whether they're public, whether they're private, whether they're uh, in home, whether they're in center based care. So, um, again, we're, you know, we, we think that coming together uh, will both preserve some of the unique aspects that families choose to have uh, children in smaller settings but also allow some of the benefits um, of better coordination, collaboration opportunities across different types of early care and learning to really help our overall system. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Representative Payal, do you have a follow-up? Not at the moment. Okay. Um, we have um, three people, Representative Redmond, um, Representative Brumstead, and Representative um, Austin. Representative Thank Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this, this really is, has a little bit of um, a question uh, for the uh, AOE and um, DCF, I would say. Um, and it, this is a kind of a hard thing to put your finger on because it's not a very tangible thing. I understand the, um, the piece about um, billing differently and um, putting the expertise in the agencies that, you know, where that expertise lies, public health. And, um, but the, the agencies and departments have different cultures. I'm, I'm trying to get a culture, kind of the culture back of, um, you, you know, they have different cultures. Um, AOE has um, kind of a different cultural approach in from what I've heard around early care and learning. So I have concerns about, um, you know, this area going to AOE um, in um, a very large agency um, that has a lot of priorities and concerns. And, um, you know, from a very tight knit department that's working, you know, across all of these issues together in a more integrated way. Um, I know that AOE, you know, has, there are vacancies there. There's been some challenges in hiring. Um, and when I, you know, when I go to my school board meetings, I hear quite a bit about how challenging it can be at times to interface with folks at AOE. So, so that's my, my concern is just, they're very different cultures from those two. And I have real concerns about how this kind of gem of a thing that's working well, or seems to be working well, at least from the outside, um, will be impacted, frankly, by, by moving into such a 
you know, be, be kind of separated into all of these areas with a lot of it being held by AOE. So I don't know how, you know, if you can respond to that. That's a primary, and I've heard from many stakeholders about this, about this particular cultural issue. Can I uh, jump in to start us off, Commissioner Brown? Sure, on that? please, please. Um, so I um, really appreciate the question and I'm very aware of um, some of the thinking and the concerns behind it. Um, it's interesting about the size of the agencies. Uh, so I wanted to tackle that one first. So I actually believe um, because of the existing CDD staff, this division would be the largest in our actual agency of education. So it's interesting to think about a program moving from what our, from our perspective is a bit of a behemoth agency in terms of human services to a very small agency of education comparatively. So I would have to kind of like think more about that because um, I, I think I think um, the notion that it would be moving into a bigger bureau bureaucratic context is actually not borne out by the reality. Um, so I'd wanna kind of think more about that and maybe sort of discuss more about like sort of what, where some of that thinking is coming from and, and then just um, kind of talk through that a bit more. The second piece about culture, um, I will say uh, professionally and personally has, um, has been uh, challenging for me. And part of that is because um, I myself um, have, my entire career has been based in the context of child development. I'm actually a developmental psychologist who has done her entire career within education settings. In fact, when I was an undergrad, uh, before I graduated with my bachelor's degree, my very first sort of official teaching roles were actually a childcare center at the campus that I actually graduated from. And then my first job was actually at a private childcare center when I, um, when I, when I graduated from college before I went into grad school. So I think um, one of the benefits of this approach would be to really try and, and break down that silo that there's something really um, that there's something like hard and fast about groups of people that want to ensure that students are taken care of. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. Both the education system and um, our early childcare system care about making sure students are developing and doing well, not just in terms of learning, but also in terms of their um, social emotional growth. And I, I really would welcome the conversation um, to further unpackage that and think about um, where some of those barriers and challenges come from. Um, because I don't, I don't think um, when I'm out in public schools, um, I, I'm not seeing where, um, I'm not seeing where that has to be, that, that should or must be an automatic barrier or assumption. And if I could jump in, I also see it as an opportunity as well um, in terms of, you know, we have some incredibly talented and dedicated and knowledgeable staff at the Child Development Division and also out in the field. And so that's not going to be lost in this initiative. And I think there's value in, um, in sharing the knowledge and expertise that both uh, uh, staff from AOE and the providers and the CDV staff, when you bring them under the same umbrella, I think there's opportunity there, uh, not risk, because I think um, there's value in, um, in sharing, you know, those cultures together and understanding what each brings to the table. And, and I think that's when you see growth and development and, and you see innovative change is when you merge those synergies together. Um, and that's just from experience and, and, and working in the human services field and, and, and program change. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity here for the state um, um, you know, under this proposal, but I, I certainly understand um, there are certain, there, there are different cultures between the two agencies, uh, but I don't think, I don't see that as a barrier. I see that as an ability to, to, to merge them together and strengthen both. And just, to, this is not personal. This is just what I have received, you know, from 
you know, this is not one common or two, this is over a period of time. So just to be clear. Sure. Representative Brumstead and then Representative Austin. Although Representative Austin, your hand went down. So I'm all set, thank you. Okay, Representative Brumstead. Thank you. I, um, I wanna just go back to the CIS question. Um, for me, CIS, as we, the words we're using are CIS bundled and then decoupled. And so these, I just want us to remember too, that these are our most vulnerable families and we pulled them together for integration in order to not just for what happens financially inside of government, but also how these families are dealing with multiple things going on in their lives and being able to come to one place. The, um, right now, it seems like we're talking about it spreading out over three different agencies, mental health as well. And that the question for me is before we do something, I, I get the money piece. I've had to work on that in committee. So I understand that piece quite well. But the question that I asked a year ago when I was working on this piece was, is CIS working? And are we doing a good job meeting the needs of the families and the kids? And that that's the real question. And it does seem like we are because every time a tiny um, pullback is made, you notice it right away because these, these families are in such dire need of help in order to keep their child integrated into, into the systems. And it seems like we're doing a good job. So across the whole piece, my worry is, have we talked to the families before we come forward with a new, a, a new way of doing business inside of government? I think that, um, I'm one of the, I'm on the government um, accountability committee as well. And whether or not government is accountable is the data that's driven by the people that are impacted by the programs. And so I, I don't really, I'm asking a question of whether or not, I guess, have you talked with the families? Have you talked with the, with the children about how the programs are working? I think that's the work uh, that will happen in the coming months in terms of really um, getting feedback from the different providers and the Vermonters that participate in these programs to make sure when we move forward with any change that we take their concerns. You know, we have a vision right now of what we think that we, we're proposing this looks like. We, may, we can co certainly come back to you based on those conversations and say, we think this piece of the proposal that we initially thought looked this way should look this way. And I think we're open to under to, to knowing um, when we need to shift our proposal in response to the feedback we're hearing and making sure that children and families continue to receive the highest level of service that they're accustomed to, but also are there ways that we can increase that as well? And so I, you know, our commitment is, is that we will be um, talking to um, our partners, our providers, um, and then making sure whatever we move forward next year in the legislature um, as, as the final product of that, the proposal as it will look all fine tuned, has all of that feedback incorporated into it. So we, so what we're proposing now could look different a Representative Brumstead based on those conversations. So it's too bad that maybe we couldn't have done that last summer and then come forward with, but just to get a sense before you go through all that work, whether or not People are happy. People are programs working, being integrated oh, where they are. Well, and, and I would say that, you know, the, the service is still delivered by multiple providers. It's how we pay for those services that looks different than, than it used to. Those services will still be provided. It's just how they get paid for those services will be different because it'll be unbundled and they, they can now bill separately for each unique service. The service delivery doesn't go away. It just, it, it's, it's how we've approached the bundling of that will look different. And that's what seems so odd to me, honestly, is that our healthcare system, a lot of our world right now is moving in the opposite direction. Um, we're moving away from fee-for-service and into bundled managed care. So why wouldn't we want to do that in this and I system? think what, what you've heard is that we'll be able to still, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sorry, uh, we, we, um, 
I don't know if the education the education committee may um, get into less um, uh, debating of witnesses than we do. Um, when we have strong opinions, we make sure that they our witnesses seem to know what they are. Um, and I am teasing Representative Brumstead because she's only the one of uh, seven of us who have spoken, myself included, um, and uh, expressed some uh, concerns. Um, Repres yeah. Representative Webb, I want to turn it over to you. Yes, and, and I think that the questions that are being raised are certainly questions that everybody's going to need to consider um, as, as we move forward or not after we actually see the uh, bill coming forward, which I assume is coming from the administration, which will give us a, a, a place to uh, have all of those conversations. We are a deliberative body and we will have an opportunity to, to address all of those things. And I'm sure knowing the Committee on Human Services and Education, we will be debating all of those issues. Um, and if there are no fi um, final um, comments um, that uh, Commissioner Yu or um, uh, Deputy Secretary um, um, Boucher or, um, if, uh, or Commissioner Squirrel, Squirrel want to make, we will... We will conclude this hearing, um, but if you have a final comment, just let me know. Yeah, I just want to thank the com both committees for your time today. Um, as a department, we don't normally appear before the Education Committee on a regular basis, so this has been a great opportunity to get to know you all, so I appreciate that. Um, and I would just say, um, you know, wherever this leads, you know, the questions and the comments from committee members and that deliberative process, I think always make for a better outcome, whatever that outcome is. And so we've always appreciated our partnership and, uh, and the inquiry from our uh, committee members. So thank you. I, if it's okay, uh, uh, Chairwoman, I would echo those thoughts and um, also thank, um, Thank you for the opportunity to meet more um, representatives from the Human Services Committee. I know a couple, but don't often get to interact with you all. Um, and nice to see the, the representatives from education again. Um, I really enjoyed all of the questions. I think the way we move forward is, is to really raise, uh, you know, truthful, tough questions. And that's actually how we move forward in the right way we need to. Um, this is a, you know, this is, um, a meaty proposal. So I think we came into this um, expecting um, that we will, we have a lot of work ahead of us to do if we want to bring it to fruition. And we look forward to partnering with you all um, um, to see to see how this goes. Thank you. I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, Com Commissioner uh, Squirrel, but I guess I am. <laughs> Uh, no, I'll just echo the comments from my colleagues. Uh, thank you for your time this morning um, to hear this proposal. I think, you know, fundamentally, um, it is really about the North Star of our accountability um, is to the children and families that we serve and support. Um, collaboration, partnership um, are the fundamental tenets of our work. And I think that's reflected in some of the discussions that we're having today. Um, and it's also just great to see other uh, early childhood partners again. Um, and again, this is a nice opportunity um, to focus a little bit on early childhood um, mental health as well. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And thank you all for spending um, <clears throat> your morning with us. And I imagine that separately and together, uh, the committees will um, be hearing from, fr from you and others um, as this gets fleshed out. So um, this, uh, this is the conclusion of the joint hearing of the Vermont House Human Services Committee and House Education Committee on the governor's proposal um, to uh, eliminate the Child Development Division and move childcare and other functions um, to the department, to the Agency of Education and elsewhere. Uh, 